Welcome to The Brain Trust, a physician's guide to diagnosing Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, brought to you from the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians. I'm Dr. Kate Rowland, family physician, member of the IAFP, and faculty at Rush University. Funding for this podcast series was provided by a grant from the Illinois Department of Public Health. The goal of The Brain Trust and this podcast series is to educate and empower the primary care clinician in the early detection, diagnosis, and management of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Clinical resources, free CME, and other educational materials are available online at thebraintrustproject.com. CME credit is available for each podcast. The Illinois Academy of Family Physicians is accredited by the Accreditation Council of Continuing Medical Education to provide continuing medical education for physicians. Information on how to receive credit can be found on the Brain Trust Project website. Thank you for joining us as we empower each other and provide training on the early detection of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And now, today's episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome again to our next series in the podcast, The Brain Trust, where we're talking about early detection of Alzheimer's and related dementia in primary care settings. And today, we have a really special opportunity to spend some time uh, to talk again about an important issue about how do we get to early diagnosis and detection in communities that are sometimes underserved, including the African-American community. This is building up on a prior podcast that we had had with Dr. Scott Levin at uh, West Suburban earlier in our series about uh, how to approach uh, improving our early detection and diagnosis in the African-American communities. And it's a nice way to start the new year. And so I'm in my car and I've just finished traveling on the local expressways from Naperville, crossed over into Indiana, and I'm in Munster, uh, Indiana today, where I'm meeting a dear friend and colleague where we've known each other since our residency at West Suburban, Dr. Tanya Austin, uh, who's an assistant professor in family and preventive medicine at Rush University and a, a longtime primary provider in what we consider sort of the south of Chicago or the southland of Chicago. And I'm here at her new practice in Munster as part of the Rush system. So, Tanya, thanks for uh, having me here today, and uh, Happy New Year to you. A uh, Happy New Year to you as well, Raj, and thank you for traveling all this way. Good to see you. You look great. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, wonderful, and I uh, appreciate, yeah, always getting a chance to see you in person. Um, but yeah, I was just sort of like really curious uh, if you wanted to start out for our audience, just a little bit about your story as how you've had your path in practicing family medicine in the Chicagoland region since we finished up residency at West Suburban. So if you can give us a little background of, you know, where you've been and who you are, that would be great. Sure, I'd be happy to. So actually, you may not know I am a transplant to Chicago. I actually uh -huh. grew up in uh, Carson, California. And while in Carson, I was surrounded by, Indian, or essentially what I sought to do was to head to medical school in an effort to be able to help those in communities that mirrored the one in which I grew up. So predominantly African-American, where unfortunately there was a lot of chronic disease state, such as diabetes, hypertension, et cetera. And what I noticed is that the individuals in my community were impacted significantly by those conditions because A, there was a distrust in terms of just medicine and, you know, presenting to doctors' offices. Hence, by the time in which those individuals did, uh, the disease states had pretty badly affected them. Or, essentially, the individuals didn't really understand their disease state. They didn't really get the information that they needed in order to um, empower themselves to be proactive about preventing some of those complications. So I really wanted to, you know, become a physician garner those tools and then head back to serve such a community as that. So that led me to Chicago where I attended Northwestern Medical School, did some work in the brain greedy community. From there, I headed to West Suburban uh, Residency Program where we met. And as you know, in residency, you have an opportunity to choose your clinical experience. And so I sought to work in what would be considered the federally qualified health center affiliated with our residency program there. And from there, I headed to the south side of Chicago, um, where I was first employed at Christian Community Health Center in Roseland. And uh, just at pretty much my, the 
entire career uh, stayed um, in the Southland, consisting of, again, either just moving further south. And currently, I am in Northwest Indiana in Munster, as you mentioned. However, Northwest Indiana, or Munster specifically, is just a stone's throw away <laughs> yeah. from uh, Chicago. So I'm still pretty much living and serving those who I have uh, my entire career in the Southland of Chicago. Yeah, that's great. No, thanks for sharing that story. I'm, I'm surprised you made it all those years after leaving <laughs> California to become part of the Midwest. You're a success story for all of us. So that's great. If you wanted to expand a little bit about the community on on the Southland uh, that you've mainly been practicing on and with and, and supporting in your primary care uh, family medicine role, and some of the characteristics of the community um, and how well it fit with the community you grew up in and in, in, in Southern California and some of the, the unique features that the community has to work through, especially some of the older adults in the community. My patient population is, I would say, and has always been approximately 80 to 85 percent African-American and uh, with the rest of the patient population consisting also of other minority patient populations such as, you know, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, and then Caucasian. The Southland is very uh, unique in that the, although where I've been practicing the patient population is predominantly African-American, is very diverse in terms of a financial mm -hmm. um, state. So essentially there are places where people or patients are We'll just say uh, well above the you know middle or high income, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can essentially just go perhaps a mile or two in goal. Patients are low income, um, so very very diverse in that sense. There are, uh, despite being a very large area, still very few hospitals uh, mm -hmm. in the area and very few doctors' offices, mm -hmm. uh, which makes it challenging in terms of uh, certain resources. However, I will say most, certainly not all, but most of the physicians that do care for the patients like myself reside in the region, mm -hmm. uh, which really gives us a great uh, perspective and a pulse on what is uh, needed. Mm -hmm. The area here, um, because of the, you know, diversity in terms of just finances is still plate um, as the community that I grew up in with a chronic disease state. Unfortunately, um, as I've continued to practice all year, I would say, you know, there's a dialysis center almost mm -hmm. you know, every five blocks. Wow. I am definitely seeing an increase in the rate at which Alzheimer's disease and other dementias are starting to plague the patient population, particularly those, you know, 65 and older. Um, and I'm sure a lot of that has to do with the fact that, again, the increased prevalence of chronic conditions that increase their um, risk, such as hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. Yeah, you're definitely telling a story that even nationally groups that have been looking at the patterns and epidemiology point to. So like even the most recent Alzheimer's Association facts and figures report you know, mentions that African-Americans are about twofold increased risk for developing a dementia. Uh, Latinos about 1.5 increased risk for developing a dementia. And it's tied with some of these factors that you're bringing up, um, you know, about vascular conditions early in life and um, uh, the impacts of chronic kidney disease. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, they all play a role and they're all driven also by just access ser to services and some of the structural patterns of, you know, resources and support for communities. And and I just wanted to kind of get a sense because I think sometimes we, we look at a community like the African-American community as monolithic, like it's all the mm -hmm. same. But I think you're bringing out like even there's so much differential in a community, even in the Southland, as far as like socioeconomic status, about right. other conditions that affect people's well-being. And you've had an opportunity to practice, at least in the Chicago area, like on the west side of the city in an urban area, like on the border of Austin and Oak Park and Roseland as a community within Chicago on the south side. And then in sort of the, the metro area or the suburban areas uh, that are further mm -hmm. south of the city in your current roles. 
And and can you kind of talk a little bit about that, you know, diversity of the African-American community and how that plays a role sometimes and, you know, maybe changing the approaches around diagnosis and, and caring, you know, an early detection of Alzheimer's disease or related dementias? The approach that I've had, which is what drew me to family medicine to begin with, is just recognizing that first and foremost, regardless of where a person is in their socioeconomic status or their educational status um, is to not assume that, just to not assume when it comes to discussing disease states or patterns or what they know. And so just really taking the time to uh, stress with that individual that essentially my goal is to partner with them to Mm -hmm. keep them healthy. And uh, part of that or the main piece of that is them being able to understand why it is that certain recommendations are being made and then empowering them the ability to uh, have some shared decision making in terms of what it is that we're trying to to face. And I've just found that, um, especially amongst African Americans, where again, as I've mentioned before, there's just been this heightened level of distrust that's just been passed on through you know, generations that um, that's greatly appreciated and has really seen as caring. And so people become more engaged and more proactive in terms of just trying to uh, seek out all the care that they need. Some of the barriers, particularly though, in the Southland really have to do with, as I alluded to, access. And so that access is very layered, if you will. So when I say access, um, that may pertain to the fact that there may be um, a specialist that a primary care physician such as myself can partner with for certain patients, um, either due to the fact that perhaps that specialist, because they're, you know, one of very few in the area, may also have a huge role in the community hospital. Um, for instance, like a neurologist um, mm. may be over the stroke program. And yeah. so their office hours are few far and in between. Um, or perhaps, you know, um, from a socioeconomic standpoint, they don't accept certain insurances. Mm. And so for my patients who, you know, don't have you know, private insurance or maybe you know, have, uh, you know, Medicaid um, or even Medicare, they may be shut out from those few individuals that may be in their area um, due to insurance issues. Or it could be a matter of transportation. What, you know, the beauty of living in the community is that you are more familiar or have ease in terms of being able to help people overcome some of those or find ways for to assist oh, the patient yeah. on some of those mm-hmm. challenges. And so, for instance, I know one of the community hospitals out this way has a transportation system called CareWings. And mm-hmm. so for individuals who may need to see a certain specialists that may be on their campus or what have you, they would transport them freely, but that's, you know, a resource. So like I said, access is um, just multi-layered. The barrier may be financial. The barrier may be just too few uh, specialists. And so that's where you as the primary care physician kind of have to step in to essentially help to do some of those things that may typically be done in the specialist office um, in an effort to make once the patient is able to penetrate uh, that specialist office, the visit is more meaningful. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. I mean, what I'm hearing and correct me if I'm wrong is like uh, some of the challenges you're noticing are challenges faced by anybody in in society that's as a person trying to deal with memory loss and trying to get resources and understand what's happening with their primary care doctor. And, you know, um, some of it's like having the time just to spend, to talk about things in a trusting, safe space with the person they value and who's known them for a while, like a primary care physician, to break down kind of what's happening and why we're doing certain things. So it's building that individual level of not having biases come into sort of what you anticipate to happen with that person, but creating a space where you can work together 
to, oh. to find a pathway forward. And then they have some real legitimate challenges like uh, getting access to a next level of uh, helping to, you know, coordinate a diagnosis or to get the right test, like an MRI scan or a CT scan or, and there are so many struggles, whether it be through transportation access or through access of the health professionals or resources that are based on insurance. Uh, and th that makes it a lot tougher sometimes uh, for a community to get through this. And that's why the skills of a primary care doctor become so important is to be able to understand that person in front of them and to kind of work through and understand their community and to be the link between those two pieces. And that's why it's so powerful that you live in the communities and understand how they work and, you know, can connect people through that. And they know that you are, are kind of from the community and that you know some of those connections to resources. And I'm just kind of curious if you could spend a little time talking about how to work through some of those challenges that you mentioned or others. You know, one challenge that you brought up was just even the fact that, okay, I, I, I would love to be able to send this person to see a specialist, but the specialist around this area either have a long wait list or that they may not take the insurance that the person has. And, and what kind of things do you do as a primary care physician to kind of work through that challenge with that person as far as, you know, getting to a diagnosis if you can't necessarily say, okay, I, I can send them to a colleague that can do this evaluation and give me some suggestions. I'm curious, like what you tend to do in the office in those situations. So as I stated earlier, I try to complete what I know would happen uh, once the person has the opportunity to interface with that specialist for a more in-depth evaluation or what we would call a neurocognitive evaluation. So the patient may say, hey, doc, you know, I've been having some memory issues. So we review their history first and foremost, just to see if there's something there that uh, could be contributing to another type of dementia, not necessarily Alzheimer's. Yeah. I start the metabolic workup, uh -huh. the 12 the TSH. I try to advocate for some early Im imaging, such as MRI. Oftentimes, it is very difficult or challenging for that, though, because of you know, the insurance barriers. Oftentimes, insurance providers require the patient to actually interface with the specialist. They wow. won't take okay. necessarily the word of the primary care physician. Yeah. Well, hopefully <laughs> we can keep working with groups like the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians to change that around, yes. right? Yes, uh, to, yes, to very much access so. for our communities, uh, yeah. Absolutely. And then, you know, essentially carving out some time to bring the patient back in to be able to perform some more in-depth cognitive evaluation, be that at their preventative care visit or what people know as their annual physical for those individuals who may be over 65, their Medicare wellness visit, that was fine. Um, yeah. We do something called a Medicare health risk assessment where we look at or ask questions pertaining to their activities of daily living to give us an idea as to uh, if some of those memory issues that they may have brought up, how significantly they may be impacting their day to day. We do also a cognitive evaluation, be that using like their mental status exam, be it, I think there's a tool called the, the six tool, um, where it's just a simple yes, no, uh, okay. you know, yeah. uh -huh. pertaining to memory issues. Yeah. So just, again, just trying to get an understanding of where they are, if there are definitely some cognitive deficits there that may be early and how significantly they may be impacting that individual. And if there is some significant impact um, then considering starting some type of uh, cognitive or medicine that could help with that, that cognitive issue, because it may very well be early dementia. And then me personally, um, what I try to do, especially being in the community as a, you know, community physician, is just really trying to put myself in spaces, even though I'm, you may not know I'm a very shy person, <laughs> but putting myself in spaces where... If I send a patient somewhere, hopefully there will be some name recognition and that mm -hmm. will allow that patient to be able to interface sooner. So that means, you know, getting involved in medical staff leadership at my local hospital. That means getting to know some of the case managers or seeking out who mm -hmm. the case managers may be with certain insurance groups or, you know, physician health organizations. 
participating with some of those physician health organizations if allowed the opportunity to do so. And, you know, just some of the local church groups, uh, you know, there are some pretty big mega churches out here. So just trying to put myself in places where I have an opportunity to interface with individuals who may be able to help me identify resources. And then the one of the greater resources that are out there now that I'm happy to say is the um, Alzheimer's Association and their website is fabulous in terms of just having a, a means to be able to direct a patient to, uh-huh. to attain some uh, resources that may be, be needed. Yeah, no, great. I really love like the way, you know, you don't stop if you're a little bit delayed or, you know, the patients are delayed in getting an appointment with the specialist, even though you would, you may want to have that as the original pathway that you just have to continue to work right with the person and you don't have to do it all at one visit. You can break it apart or, you know, have them come for like an annual physical or annual wellness visit for Medicare and use that as your opportunity to engage with uh, the person and to build um, kind of a trust and a storyline over time and do the workup because in the end you've mentioned the workup, right? Like you did all the asking them about where they're at with their cognition and then checking for other conditions that might be related that could be solvable and then uh, seeking out imaging if possible and not hesitating to sometimes make the diagnosis and start somebody on an appropriate treatment to start the process and then connecting them with the community resources. So I, I think you're doing all the the wonderful right things that a good primary care family physician working with diverse populations does to support a community through that. And, you know, as we are approaching the end of our time together, I was just wondering about, is there an experience, like a positive experience you've had in sort of doing that early diagnosis and uh, pathway with uh, a family and really helping them through sort of uh, that walking with them in that journey as they, you know, bring up an issue with memory loss and then helping them to get to that diagnosis and treatment options? Yes, actually, recently I have a uh, elderly African American couple. Um, I see the wife as a patient, and she does have early Alzheimer's dementia. And uh, the benefit, knowing that, is that she and her husband now have the opportunity. Well, she and her husband now have the opportunity to sit down and really just make some decisions going oh, forward in terms of finances, their living will just uh, the anxiety of, you know, knowing, okay, I'm not crazy. Something is going on. And just essentially having that, uh, that why in terms of why I'm feeling this way I'm feeling. Um, And then that's kind of helped to alleviate some of the depression, obviously, that goes along with that. And so being able to then know the diagnosis has allowed us to put them in touch with the resources where the wife is able to actually go out and interface with individuals her her own age and still continue to live and realizing living is a uh, very important in in terms of just uh you know working through this condition yeah. and, and the husband has gotten some support as well through support groups and things of that nature so just helping them true. you know where they are and then just trying to help them feel more comfortable in terms of where they're going and then just be prepared for all that may come with that. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, I'm glad that you're part of that, right, as a physician in that process, helping them through the steps and the planning. And there's a lot that they can do, right, to maintain the quality of life and the right connections in a community. And in general, in Illinois, we're trying and around the country, we're trying to build more of these dementia friendly communities to reduce stigma, to help people get an early diagnosis and to grow. And we'd love to see more communities in the Southland go through that process you know, with the help and support of their local hospitals, healthcare systems, and others. And as we wrap up today, and you know, any final word you would have, apart from like encouraging more physicians to join you in the Southland to help practice and to help the community <laughs> out as far as what they can do, whether at, you know, their stages in their primary care career, including some residents about, you know, serving the African-American community and uh, encouragement to help to make an early diagnosis. Any final words you have for us? Well, I certainly would like to just encourage my family, fellow family physicians to remember why you chose family medicine to begin with. And that was essentially because you sought to be a partner with the individuals that you are serving 
in terms of helping them to be more proactive in preventing complications for certain disease states that they encounter, uh, helping them live better, more healthy lives. So that includes essentially sitting down with them and really acting as a go-between when they're in certain challenging positions, such as with dementia. Mm, uh, bring, yeah. you know, that includes bringing them back uh, frequently just to check in to see how things are going. How can I be of help? Is there anything that you need me to explain or perhaps continuing those measures that perhaps were started by the specialist, but the, you know, because of the limited access, you know, the patient may not necessarily, you know, they get lost, if you will, because of the limited access for follow-up. So you being that follow-up and not being afraid to, like I said, be that resource, be that, that bridge in between the gap, that's especially appreciated in the African-American community. But with that being said, Raj, I do actually have a question for you. Okay. Um, so the Southland, <laughs> if you don't mind. So my question for you is, I'm said constantly about the limited resources. I was just wondering if you had any idea as to um, what efforts, if any, are being made to further educate those who are taking care of large patient, African-American patient populations, particularly in the Southland and to improve access to some of those resources out this way? Yeah, I think it's definitely a multi-pronged area. I know we'd love to kind of have a broader conversation and bring this up in the future, but I think some bigger avenues is making these communities more acceptable to dementia friendly, becoming dementia friendly through a process that's nationally recognized. And uh, we've have 30 communities in the Chicago, uh, in, in Illinois that are part of that through some work we've been doing in an initiative called Dementia Friendly Illinois. And that involves all stakeholders from librarians to, you know, police uh, and uh, firefighters to local uh, businesses and including, you know, primary care offices working together to reduce stigma and to help people to get the services and connection and to talk about this. This has also included some training of community health workers through a grant through the Illinois Department of Public Health to get the message out in churches around early diagnosis and to seek care from primary care doctors. And sessions like this that we just had, which is such a wonderful way to begin the new year, where we can talk uh, with actual primary care physicians working in these settings about their needs and uh, their creativity and handling some of these issues and sharing that message with others is so important. So I know I've taken a lot of your time today and I appreciate all the things that you've done and told us. It was a wonderful session. And so that brings us to the end of our episode of this podcast of The Brain Trust. And Tanya, thanks so much again for your time. Really appreciated it. Thank you, Raj. And thank you for all that you do. Thank you to our expert faculty and to you, our listeners, for tuning into this episode. If you have any comments, questions, or ideas for future topics, please contact us at podcast at thebraintrust.com. For more episodes of The Brain Trust, please visit our website, thebraintrustproject.com. You'll find transcripts, speaker disclosures, instructions to claim CME credit, and other Alzheimer's resources as well. Subscribe to this podcast series on Healthcare Now Radio, Spotify, Apple, Google Play, or any major podcast platform. Thank you again, and we hope you tune into the next episode of The Brain Trust.